our first session is from idea to implementation, the journey in developing an OER textbook. Please take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Heather Adair, and I'm here today with my uh, colleague, uh, Forrest Lane. We're at Sam Houston State University, and we're going to briefly discuss um, our process from how we got started on this, how we implemented it, and, and what our journey kind of looked like as we um, embarked on developing a OER textbook for our first year experience course. So basically our agenda is what is the source of the idea, kind of charting that journey towards implementation, the lessons that we learned along the way, um, and uh, resources to kind of go along with everything in case you would want to uh, replicate what we're doing. So um, the first part of that, so what got us started was we had a reimagining the first year experience um, committee on campus. And one of their charges or um, initiatives was to develop OER textbooks that supported high frequency first year courses to make um, it, them more accessible for uh, our students in those courses. And kind of connected to that um, was at the same time, I happened to be uh, working on a grant. This is how Heather and I actually got connected in the first place. I was working on a grant that was uh, trying to pair our first year seminar with um, our developmental mathematics uh, or remedial courses. And so uh, through that process, especially in developing that, we were specifically trying to develop an online first year seminar that could support them. And so that kind of also led uh, to how do we create online materials uh, for those students in that online course. So that grant also helped uh, to support uh, the development of some of those digital materials and was corresponding again with that reimagining the first year OER grant. And so that was a unique opportunity for us. Um, it, you know, the other piece of that too was uh, at the same time, our first year seminar at our institution was going through some transition. It was moving from a three credit hour course to a one credit hour course, mostly in an effort to be able to include that in the general core. Uh, I know those of your institutions, most institutions offer a first year seminar. Uh, how they deliver it really varies, uh, but we were in transition to a one credit hour course. And that also had us rethinking about, you know, what is an appropriate uh, course material? Uh, how do we do that and make sure that we're reading a broad, broader audience uh, for the number of students that we would wind up serving through that kind of transition? And throughout the process, it was kind of interesting because it it um, kind of lined up very nicely with what was happening in the, the changing landscape in education at the state and national level. So there were initiatives going on, there were trends that were developing, and this kind of paired really well with that. Um, I watched the Michigan State presentation earlier today, and boy, if I would have had their timeline and their flowchart when we started this project, um, our lessons learned would probably be very different. But when we started this in 2019, it was just kind of at the beginning of the process. So as we mentioned, this was to touch our first year experience high frequency courses. This is just a sampling of some of those courses that were going through an OER grant process, kind of like uh, Forrest and I were doing in our first year experience course. So, um, and this is just a sample, but these are the ones that were early adopters that got through the grant cycle um, kind of early on, um, just to kind of give a picture of what students were paying per textbook originally for a print textbook, how many students that touched throughout the process and after um, two years of implementation, how much potentially those students were saving in those courses. Um, you'll notice the enrollment kind of shifts from 2019 to 2020 because more sections were adopting um, the OER materials, our University 1101, 1301 course in particular, which was one that Forrest and I had worked on. Um, it piloted in only a couple of sections, well, 681 students in 2020, that was the entirety of the course, all sections. So that's why there's a little bit of a difference, but the impact for our students was um, pretty vast. So um, we talked about kind of how that rolled out and what those pilot courses are. 
So to kind of give you some, that gives you kind of the context of where we started. So this was kind of our journey. Um, our purpose was to develop an OER um, textbook that would support our students, um, that would kind of reflect the, the class. We did have a kind of a struggle because as Forrest mentioned, our first year experience course was going through a redesign. Um, so the content was shifting and it was going from a three credit to a one credit. There was a lot of things in play. So we had to kind of develop our purpose or define our purpose on a moving target. So it wasn't really fixed. So we kind of had to figure out, all right, what is it we really want to do? And how long is it going to take? Um, now, of course, you notice we started this pre-COVID um, and COVID kind of got in the mix and adjusted our timeline for us a couple of times. But even with those adjustments, it seems like we stayed fairly well on point and on track. Uh, we still ended up completing the project or the, the beginning stages of the project and implementation um, when we had initially intended to. We just felt like we were kind of fast tracking at one point in time. So that kind of gets us through the purpose and the timeline. And Forrest is gonna talk a little bit more about how we made some content and authorship decisions. Yeah, and I'll just add real quickly in terms of the timeline, what we basically created was a year, a little bit more than a year long process initially that actually got expanded over time. But the, the rationale behind that was uh, we wanted to try to allow us time, not just to create or curate the content, but also to do some quality control in that, which I know we'll talk about in just a moment, but um, we wanted to allow enough time for a peer review process. And that takes, you know, you have to build that in. And so again, we, we started with about a, a year initially, but I think that really got expanded out to about 18 months. Uh, in terms of, you know, content and authorship, we really wanted to make sure that we were developing a resource that was accessible uh, for our audience, which in this case was entering freshmen, uh, that it also provided some flexibility for instructors, uh, even though it is a, a course with many sections. I mean, here, I, I don't know this semester, but it's probably 40 plus sections uh, that are being offered. But even within that uh, a common course shell like that, there's still you know differences in the way instructors approach that. Um, and that it could also be, we wanted a resource that could be um, adapted to an institutional context. This particular course is meant to serve students transitioning into the institution and we really wanted to have a course that um, was able to do that. So we wanted to um, also use the course to help uh, connect students with faculty and staff on campus. So when we were thinking about author authorship that uh, had us reach out to, or create an opportunity maybe for us to reach out to other experts on campus. Part of that seminar, if you're not familiar with it, as I said, is to help students transition. So we talk about lots of things. Some of that is uh, academic skill development. Uh, some of that is connecting them to resources on campus. Um, sometimes it's, it's learning, uh, you know, learning processes and things like that. But we have experts on campus and wanted to reach out to them to have uh, them develop chapters for this. Uh, but we also, as I mentioned, wanted to have a level of quality control on that. So that meant trying to implement some kind of peer review process. So we established a process and timeline that attempted to mirror a process we would expect in, in a print publication. Uh, we requested initial chapter proposals. Proposals were then reviewed. Authors were then, um, depending on those proposals, uh, authors were, were then uh, invited uh, to develop full-length chapters. If it was appropriate, we'd try to keep those chapters to no more than 5,000 words, uh, just based on the kind of resource we were trying to put together. Uh, they were sent out for blind review to reviewers, uh, both internally and externally the institution, particularly when there are topics where other fields uh, might be appropriate to review that and authors made revisions. And so again, all of that took uh, about a year to do uh, and to give time. And of course that was happening during the pandemic. We did explore several platform options. Uh, and I think that kind of takes us into what Heather's gonna talk a little bit more about. Yeah, deciding on a platform was kind of, um, and I'll take us back to the previous slide. So. When we were investigating platform and publication um, options, we'd already had um, an opportunity to have a conversation with OpenStax in a, in a different environment. Um, and we were kind of doing some fact finding. Um, you know, what did we want? You know, of course, as you know, in an OER um, platform, 
we can do things that you can't do in print. Um, it can be interactive. We can have um, content that uh, provides different types of experiences for students that um, you know, makes it a little more interactive. Um, and how do you go about sequencing that so that it makes sense for the student as they're clicking through the content? Um, so that we kind of had to play with a little bit. And like Forrest mentioned, we didn't want chapters to be longer than a certain number of, of words, but not only that, segments within the chapters needed to be consumable so that it wasn't, you know, pages and pages of scrolling to read before they would go forward. And then we had a little bit of a learning curve about how do we actually do that? Um, what does that look like as far as, you know, Creative Commons is concerned and um, attributions and things like that? And then how do you build it? So when we started that process, um, the landscape of possible publication platforms was not as vast. Um, and I'm sure on this slide, we don't have all of them represented. But we did kind of do some um, research to figure out, you know, is it a platform that requires a fee? Are we going to have to go out and hunt down grant money? Um, how complex is it? Are we going to be able to go back and touch it later and update it? Um, how uh, predominant is that platform? Is it a common one that a common platform that is out there in the OER world? So we went through all of that decision making we ultimately decided on OER Commons. Um, that just happened to be where we landed. We didn't have a source of funding to produce the textbook, really. Um, we didn't want to have to get into a grant situation. And the nice thing about OER Commons is um, it really played well. The person that worked with us at OER Commons um, took the time to meet with us and talk about logistics and um, how to lay out the pages and how to navigate and helped us build the shell. There was a lot that went into it. And I don't want to sell you on any one platform. That was just the, the choice that we ended up making. Um, so that kind of gives us a little bit of context. Forrest, do you want to add anything that I may have left out on that? No, I think you did a good job. Okay. Um, and then, you know, of course, once you've done that, there's going to be lessons learned along the way, no matter what happens. Um, and we did that. So as we were looking for some of the things, we noticed that we, well, we like Forrest said, we wanted to make this a SAM product. So a student-focused, campus-focused, environment-focused support for our students. And as we were looking at samples of what was out there, there are some generic um, OER materials out in the realm. Um, but there are also some that are very, um, campus specific or institution specific. And we wanted kind of for this to be a SAM product so that as students come in, it helps them become part of our community. So we did kind of broach that a little bit. I'm going to add to that on our lessons learned. Yeah, I think one of the um, other things, so just to give you a little bit of background about me, uh, so, you know, I've served as an editor for a peer review publication for a number of years and had some idea about how to do that from an editorial standpoint. I thought that we had built in a, a, a reasonable amount of time to do this. Of course, you can't plan for the pandemic, but I think it really did take more time to, than than I had anticipated, at least to do it well. I mean, I don't think you have to to make a, a resource that has multiple authors and chapter authors and all that. It, it doesn't have to be that complicated. But in our case, we, we did have some complexity to it. And I think really trying to work through all the questions and everything else took more time uh, than we had initially um, thought, although I was still really pleased and, and proud of how well we were able to stick to that. But I guess my, my comments would be, you know, really think seriously about the time it will take to build that kind of a resource. Uh, the other thing was just learning to move it to a digital format. You know, even in building these chapters, uh, we're having authors write that in, you know, um, in Word or whatever you are using to, you know, to write that narrative. But you've then got to take that and put it into a digital format. And everything doesn't translate in the same way. If you take a 5,000 word chapter, you know, it, you just don't turn the page and you don't want 2,000 words on one screen. And so, you know, how do we segregate that out into chunks uh, and, and to make that meaningful. So uh, those were things that we had to kind of work through in this process. 
So it really was kind of a, um, a lesson learned as we went through and, and we would, you know, just like you do with any project, um, you know, you experience a little pebble in the road and you adjust and um, reorient and figure out how you're going to work through it. Um, our author uh, contributors were fantastic to work with. Um, the nice thing about an OER um, textbook is that it is, you know, we don't have to go back to a um, publisher per se every single time we want to make an edit. So the opportunity to make this a sustainable resource that can continue to grow and continue to develop. And as the university evolves and our students evolve um, and what their needs are, we have the ability to go back and make um, edits or revisions or add content as needed. Um, so that's nice to have something that's a little more sustainable. Um, and we did have a little bit of a learning curve um, on how to, you know, we come from academia where um, original content is, is the preference, right? So how do you give credit to material that is open access um, and how do you navigate Creative Commons licensing? So we, um, we relied fairly heavily on our scholarly communications librarian um, to kind of give us a little bit of direction on how to do that. Uh, which was very helpful because it was it was an issue for us to kind of wrap our head around that in this realm, if it's got Creative Commons licensing on it and it allows you to modify, redistribute, et cetera, that it's okay. So we did kind of have a little bit of an issue personally on the conscience side about how do we do this um, and how do we support our authors and how to, to make that transition as well. So um, we do, it does mention that we do have a balance of original content and repurposed content. If somebody else was out there that had fantastic content and we didn't have an author for that piece, um, because of Creative Commons licensing, we were able to adapt it to our situation, which was fantastic because that helped fill the gap that we knew was important for our students and for our textbook, but we just didn't have authorship on, the, on our side to provide original content. We do have um, resources for you on the slide deck also. And I believe um, Justin, he can probably provide a little bit more information if the slide decks will be provided later or not. Um, but we do have OER resources, the two QR codes. I noticed that um, Forrest put a, a note in the chat earlier. The attendee handouts takes you to our call and um, the rubric that we used with our reviewers and the other QR code on the left of this slide takes you actually to our textbook um, in real world, in real life, um, so that you can see what that kind of looks like. It is also on Texas's platform for OER materials as well as on OER Commons, so it's in both places. I know we're just about out of time. I don't know if we have a, a minute or two for a quick question, if anybody has one, but we'd be happy to take that. Yep, you have time. And uh, the recording will be available almost uh, immediately afterwards. And then if you've uploaded your slides into the Google Drive, then they'll be um, distributed by the conference. And you have a question. Are there any issues with intellectual property among the authors? Yeah, I saw that question out there, and, and it's a, a very good one. I think that we tried to be very transparent from the beginning of building this, even in our call when we were presenting this to potential authors, was to be transparent about exactly how this was going to be published, uh, what Creative Commons license, uh, and that they needed to be careful with that. They need to be comfortable with the way in which we were publishing that. Um, we didn't really run into people that were unwilling to do that, but I did, it did mean really trying to think through uh, how we communicated that and um, allowing them to understand what that license allowed and what it didn't. And we did provide, um, I guess we called them lunch and learns, although we didn't provide lunch, it just happened during lunch time, um, a couple of opportunities for interested authors to do a kind of a, a Q and A session with us and with our scholarly communications librarian um, so that we could answer those questions and kind of talk through it. So that I think that provided support for them and for us. 
Great. And if you want to hang out and continue answering questions in the chat, um, if you could go ahead and stop sharing your screen so our next presenters can make sure their slides are working. And then we'll start at 2.25 uh, to give people time to come in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like the share screen is working. Do you want to test your mics? Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? It's a little garbled, Melanie. Okay, I'll put my headset on. Thank you. And I, I will also try talking. Hopefully everyone can hear me as well. Yep, you sound good. Thank you so much. Okay, is that a little better? Slightly, so, at least. Yeah. I'm having issues with the sound card on my laptop. Ah, uh, that could do it. Yeah. I'm trying to speak as clearly and as possible. Hmm. So what I'll do is, as we get to 225, I'll uh, announce the presentation, get the links into the chat again. And then uh, when you have five minutes left, so that way, if you want to transition into Q&A, um, when you're at the five minute left mark, I'm just going to play the sound effect. So hopefully it won't uh, interrupt you too much. And just so you know Thank that you. it's coming. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We're about to get started. I'm your session moderator. My name is Justin White. I'm Scarlet Communications Librarian at University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Please keep your videos and microphones muted unless you have a question during the Q&A portion of each presentation. This session is being live captioned. I'm going to copy the code of conduct and the IT support email into the chat. And our next presentation is the sound solution. 
exploring the practice, practicality, and priority of human voice audio in OERs. Please take it away. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. To start with, we'd like to share our university statement and respectfully now acknowledge the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose historical homelands our university is located. We also recognize the historical presence of the Caddo Nation and other tribal nations in our region. So it started with a phone call. We were discussing careers and teaching when we began talking about OERs. As the introductory course coordinator for our Fundamentals of Public Speaking class, I was telling Melanie a little bit about our experience recently using an OER or about to shift to that OER. And we happened upon the idea that a human voice audio component was not something we had seen. We both had performance training in our background, so we began researching what instructors use for students with accessibility needs, especially in higher education. We couldn't find many resources, and what we did find repeatedly pointed to using artificial intelligence, or AI, to bridge the gap. Because of those performance backgrounds, however, we know there is something irreplaceable about the prosody and interpretive capabilities of human voice that we have yet to see replicated by AI. Melanie invited me to join our professional learning community sponsored by our Center for Research, Teaching, and Learning Excellence, and we began a year-long feasibility study of adding a human voice audio component to OERs, specifically to the one that we were using or are using in our Fundamentals of Public Speaking class. What we present to you today is a focus on the practicality and some of the how of adding a human voice to OERs you're thinking about creating, in the process of creating, and or are already utilizing in your classes. And so on the screen, we have a QR code that will take you to these slides, and uh, we've created a space for you to be able to take notes on the slides if that is useful. But really, we're going to walk through the decision map and some of the questions around the how-to of what it is we're hoping to see be added to OERs. So beyond our personal beliefs and preferences, we do know that there is research out there and that there are instructional advantages to audio components and moreover human voice audio versus machine created. But trust me, we're not so naive to think that considering the great amount of labor and financial cost, that AI should be discounted. It is definitely a choice. So as Molly said, whether you're creating, adopting, or adapting an OER, we'd like to share with you these questions that we think will be helpful when considering adding any kind of audio to an OER. So with our map here, the first question is, how much should be recorded? The second is then, how complex is this text? And then after these two questions are answered, then we moved to, do I have the budget? As you can see by the answers there, um, we understand that financing can be difficult. And then last but not least, where can we get the resources for these things? Um, where can we divide this labor up? So this component, um, we understand this component can be very labor intensive. So let's look at question one. So which one of these boxes would you check for your OER? You want to do the entire text. And we also understand that some OERs are truly expansive. And um, so maybe you want to pare that down a little bit. Maybe you don't want to do the entire text. Maybe you want to do just specific chapters. Or perhaps you want to do chapter outlines. Or maybe there's just some other tiny bit that you want to start out with. And so what we recommend is, as always, consult your learning outcomes and what would work most effectively with your teaching style. Would you like to comment on how you landed on with our project? Sure. So for us, our chapters in the public speaking text, there's a lot of extra information. And while it is useful if students read, I'm not 100% sure students are reading. And so for us, chapter outlines became the easiest way to get that information into a human audio voice component. 
And it also allowed for us to hit the major highlights of the text without having to potentially change that human voice component every time there's an edit on the text, which seems to be just about every summer. So I'm going to go ahead then and move on to the next question. So if we've decided a little bit about how much of the text we want to record, now we have to figure out what level it is that we're, we're trying to get to. So if the information in your text is more at a basic level, like it might be for our foundational or our fundamentals course, then that gives you a few more options in terms of a narrator. There are more people that can make sense of the information in that level of an OER. If I have a more complex uh, OER that has more technical jargon or field specific language, then I might have more difficulty finding a narrator. This is also where the, the complexity can be more of a challenge for AI, knowing how to accurately pronounce names if you're talking about a variety of theories, or even potentially reading out a mathematical formula. So understanding the complexity of what is in your text allows you to figure out what options you have as well. And the question three, and I'm very sorry that my audio is scratchy. Um, I developed a sound card issue this morning that I could not get resolved before our session. So for question number three, we're looking at budgeting and hopefully creative budgeting. And if you are lucky enough to be able to check that first box that says, yes, you have funding, that's fantastic. Uh, perhaps you've got grants. Perhaps you have um, stipends from your faculty. Uh, maybe you have some GTAs that you can use um, to help with this. And maybe you get the, the top of the mountain. Maybe you have a course uh, release for your faculty or are working on this. But then maybe you don't have all of that. Perhaps it is just a maybe. Perhaps you are looking for things. We would suggest looking at library funding or community funding. Maybe we need to just go to those people who have done this forever and I would suggest looking at the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled. I'll put a link in the chat here in just a sec. Or perhaps Lighthouse for the Blind, because let's face it, they've been using te texts for decades. And sometimes there can be funds through these organizations or other resources that we perhaps haven't thought about yet. But what if you don't have any of these? What you then would suggest is realizing that it's okay to take small leaps, to maybe just do a pilot study and just take one tiny bit of your OER and use that to see that if it is capable for you to do, or perhaps to look at some creative production and that's why we'll take the question number four. And so as we move to this last question of what other kinds of resources might we use? So if we know already that our, we know our funding situation, whether we have it or not, then we might also think about what resources we have across campus. We're lucky at UTA, at UT Arlington, that our library was just recently renovated. And so there is a podcast studio over there now where students can access. And so that might be an option that maybe as a faculty member, you might be able to access those same kinds of resources. But some of this is also about thinking creatively about getting students involved. Could you add a service learning component to your class or sort of a, a hands-on learning activity where you could have students also help make this information, make the audio component? That might be thinking about what majors you have on your campus. If you could tap into theater students, a broadcast major, we're pretty biased here, but our other communication faculty, communication students who might be able to do some of that narration work for you. Thinking also uh, across campus in terms of your library, but also thinking in terms of the community. Is there a community theater that you might be able to partner with or other nonprofits? If none of those work, then going just to your classroom. Are there students in your class that could use podcasting platforms that many of them already have some experience with, or even something as simple as a YouTube video, maybe making it solely audio? 
we realize this is not ideal, but this is still sort of our small leaps. How can we add this human voice audio component in small ways to try and figure out what we might be able to add next or how we might be able to pilot that to a bigger example later on? And we've got, Melanie's got kind of an example for us of the difference between human audio and AI. I'll play these for you today, but I have podcasts within my classroom. I've been online since 2014 teaching asynchronously. Um, and doesn't the universe laugh at us when I'm trying, we're trying to do a session about audio and my card went out. But you can go back and look at these later. I posted the, my podcast in our slides. And then the next two slides, Molly, well, if you just advance through them. The first one. For listening to the value. This is actually um, the screen reader that OpenStax recommends for students who are using resources from there to use. And then the next slide is an example of Speechify, which is another free screen reader that students can use. So you can listen to those and compare and see what you think. There are other options. Uh, some are free, some are not. And you are able to sometimes choose voices. I also realize that the punctuation within this text is not necessarily grammatically correct. I tried to put in commas to mimic your I paused in my podcast so that the machine uh, could actually try and replicate my speech pattern with it and you see it did that with varying degrees of success. And so as we kind of you're listening to the valuable voice pod come to what we have you're listening here. to the valuable oh. voice podcast. If it will let me. There we go. There we go. As we come to, to the end of what we have, we really wanted to spend a lot of time opening this up for questions, but also for crowdsourcing other ideas that people might have that we might not have come up with. And one of the, the things we really want to highlight or remind you is that we are not saying that AI is bad. Absolutely. If AI is what you have access to, then helping students have another way to access material increases inclusivity and accessibility for all of our students. What we are suggesting is that a human voice audio component to an OER increases that accessibility by helping students have another human interacting with them through that text. So our information is up here. We would love to have you reach out to us, um, but I am also gonna turn to the chat so that we can answer what questions you may have. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that I can pull the Zoom back in here. We haven't yet looked into funding sources for developing. Honestly, this was part of the feasibility study. We were gonna take the OER we were already using in public speaking and just see if we could add uh, the audio component to it. But we haven't looked into, we haven't dug down deep to see if we can find funding specifically. We know we have some great resources on our campus. So we're gonna kind of work with what we already had access to. And as Melanie can talk about, she also, uh, is it professional at this? And Melanie, if you want to talk a little bit about your experience as well. I am a, a professional voice actor and uh, audiobook narrator. And the SAG after rates for voicing, even educational texts, are what Molly and I consider prohibitive for, uh, for you know, our budgetary kinds of things. Uh, so we really wanted to look about what was on campus and how maybe we could get students. And before we started trying to look into funding for professional audio voicing of this, so many, I teach broadcast announcing, and so many of my students are already so familiar with uh, not just digital technology, but we have great studios on campus. As Molly was saying, we also have um, a fab lab in our library. So we just felt like that we wanted to start locally, right, with funding first and see and then go from there. But honestly, 
we haven't really even gotten to that point. We've just made those initial decisions, right? How much of the text do we want to do? And who might we think about using as a narrator for it? So funding is next. And that's one of the reasons I've enjoyed this conference so much is that I'm getting all sorts of ideas about where to look for these kinds of things. Well, and I think what's interesting here too is this was also part of the factor that drove us to just the chapter outlines. Uh, Melanie had had said, well, hey, I'll take a look at the outline and I'll run it through the formula we have for how we figure out how much this is going to cost on a per word basis. And that's where it was like, wow, that's a lot of words and incredibly expensive for money we at that time at least did not have. So thinking about how to make what we had or what we could use much more concise, which in a, a larger version of this project is also one of the recommendations we make is, hey, OER creators, really think about how many words you're using, especially if you don't have an editor of how you can be concise so that when we are thinking about accessibility needs, how can we make that work for all of our students as well? And our goal would be to have an audio component set up at the beginning with each OER so that it wasn't something that had to be added later and you know even just small pieces of it the chapter outlines would be so useful for adopters later absolutely are there other questions or other ideas you have of how this could maybe be useful in a class or how you might uh, be able to create that audio component Everybody's quiet this afternoon. Do you think this is even something that you would find helpful? Or that your students might find helpful, yeah. Right. Yes. And, and uh, Heather, one of the things that we did notice is that where there was an audio component, especially if it was a human voice audio component, was often related to languages, right? So helping students learn pronunciation, which is incredibly important and we're glad it exists, but we would love to see that for any field, for students to have a sense of what does this sound like? And we want to do a study on what kind of voice is palatable, acceptable, enjoyable. Um, is there a difference between a male voice and a female voice? Is there a difference um, in what students would prefer? Um, even a sort of a gender neutral kind of voicing. There's all sorts of research that we would like to continue to do on this just to see what might be preferable and most helpful. Yes. Oh, uh, yes, that is one of the things that. Uh, I spend a lot of time listening to audiobooks while I'm driving, and I, I know that there are students who want to do that same kind of thing. So even if they can get the bare minimum of information while they are busy driving, I know that's terrible, but let's say washing <laughs> the dishes or mowing the lawn or something where, where they can feel like that task is doubly productive. It is amazing for those non-traditional or post-traditional students how much time that can save and I'm hoping or we're hoping that that can also encourage students to actually do the work or engage the material outside of just coming to class too. And we have so many students who commute to class and so that's another listen to it on the way in when you're fighting traffic. And Bruce that's a great idea just um, adding boys to a glossary or a small subset like vocabulary those kinds of things. That's exactly what we're talking about. Looking at your text and finding what would be the most useful and start small and then build from there. I mean, this could be something that can be done over a period of semesters um, and you know, crowdsource. Different students could do different parts of it in different semesters. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, certainly. That 
in our larger project, that's really the big push behind this is aiming for a universal design of learning in our classrooms so that students who do have those specifically disability accommodations will hopefully already feel included and welcome in the classroom because you are already making those uh, accommodations and multiple methods of engaging the material accessible to everyone from the get go. And it doesn't just have to be a uh, focus on accessibility. Um, Audible, which is the largest platform for audiobooks, has something called um, WhisperLink because they have found out that many of their listeners um, do so because they like to have the text in front of them and also listen to the book. It helps with comprehension. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, so that is something that I think we as educators need to understand too. It's, it's not just for accessibility. Um, it also works within um, different learning styles. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, and so that will 